Welcome, Podcasting on a Plane, a realistic view of aviation from both sides of the mic. If it's your first time here, my name is Brandon Gonzalez, and I'm an air traffic tower controller. But in my 25 years of aviation, I've been a lot of things, including, but not limited to, a ramper for two major airlines, an FBO wine serviceman, aircraft salesman, CFI, pilot, and maybe some other stuff I'm not so proud of. But on this podcast, we spread the love of aviation, but with a realistic view, because aviation, if you haven't noticed, well, it's a cyclical industry. Oh, and it's a safety-sensitive one, too. So as great as it might be, there's always room for badness to happen. And when it does, well, you better be ready. Sometimes we need to check ourselves, though. Really. I mean, this is an industry which is usually fueled, to some degree at least, by passion. And that's good, right? Well, here's what I've noticed, though. In industries that are like that, and there are plenty of them, there's this thing that happens where new entrants, they get a little snake charmed into what it's going to be like, only to find out that the reality is probably a little less glamorous than they expected. And it's not just aviation. I mean, with social media now, it's really easy to get people thinking things are all rainbows and sunshine, but it's not realistic, really. I mean, things have been good for a while now in the industry, right? But people are starting to talk about how long the good economy can last. And I don't know if you've been around aviation during a recession. Well, you'll remember that aviation gets hit hard. Also, we've had three airliner crashes in the last few months. Questions are still wide open about the Atlas one, but the 737 Maxes, well, they're looking pretty straightforward, aren't they? The reality is that sometimes tough choices need to be made, and sometimes we might wish we had a redo. So, in today's episode, one listener who's got some tough choices to make about getting in, and a company that probably wishes they'd made some different ones, and now has a lot of explaining to do. And I think you know who that is. Don't go away. So aviation is a game of timing. Most of the top jobs follow some kind of seniority system, and believe me, a few days can mean the difference between time off, equipment worked, how much you get paid, even where you live, and a whole lot more. So it often feels like a race, but in an industry where taking your time and doing things right is the most important part of all, well, it's enough to make your head spin, right? Good times. If you've been listening to this podcast for really any length of time, you'll know that I usually preach to do a lot of different stuff, build up experience in different parts of the industry. You know, try on a few different things, meet people, learn, find opportunities, and then take them. And the younger you are, the easier this is. And I'm not saying that you can go just try on some heavy jet flying experience while you're still in high school or something, but you could probably get a job or an internship at the airport somewhere. But as we get older, though, the doors start closing. I mean, maybe we aren't old exactly, but the stakes just keep getting higher and higher, it seems like, with each passing year. We can't or we don't want to take the risks that others can when we have things like families to provide for, right? But what we can do is make some strategic choices. And luckily, though, that gets easier as you get older. So I got an email from a listener named Brienne, and here's what she says. Hi, Brandon. My name is Brienne. I first want to say I really enjoy listening to your podcast. I think you've done a great job of blending ATC and GA. I was wondering, though, if I could get your opinion on something. My goal is to become a controller. I love the communication side of the industry and feel like that would be a great spot for me. So I decided to attend a CTI school this fall. I had everything set up, financial aid, and I even got a scholarship. I was so excited to attend this school in Texas. And then I got an email last week saying they were no longer accepting new students and they were closing the program. I felt like everything fell apart in two seconds and I'm just not sure what to do. But one of the reasons I chose that program was because they had a dispatch program as well. So my plan was to work dispatch while I waited to get my call from the FAA, if I got the call at all. But I felt like that was a great backup plan. And so now I'm kind of looking into the dispatch side of things a little bit more. And I was wondering if it would be better to get my dispatch license through a 10-week course and work dispatch while I apply to the open enrollments that the FAA has? Or would it be better to go to another CTI school and do what I was planning in the beginning? My theory is that 
The dispatch could be a little better because it's an actual FAA license. You're already in the industry and you're working. But I feel like the CTI school is a little more direct into the FAA. And I'm just not sure what to do. And I figured since you're a controller and you're in the system, you might have a better grasp of how everything works and you might be able to give me your opinion. Oh, I should also mention I'm currently working on my private pilot's license. And once I'm done with that, my plan is to get an instrument rating. I feel like that'll help make me a better controller once I get to that point. And it'll also help make me more qualified for the open bids that the FAA has. Anyway, I look forward to your opinions and thanks so much. All right. So after listening to that, I'm sure you all fall into one of two camps, either camp A, which is where you're yelling at your car stereo right now saying, do the degree, dude, dispatch, whatever. But in other words, you've got an opinion, right? Or you're in camp B, which is where you're like, oh man, that, that really is a tough call. Kind of glad I'm not the one who has to make it. So I sent her an email back and it was hard because while I like to help people by talking about what I know about, I don't have a crystal ball, right? I can't and I won't ever tell anybody, here's what you should do. I hate it when people talk like that, really. It's like when your weird yet well-meaning uncle butts in and tries to tell you what to do with your life, but there isn't really an answer. It's just different paths you can take. But yeah, we've all been there. So here's what I think, Brianne. First off, it really sucks that the FAA got rid of the CTI program preference and that your school dropped the program. That really messed a lot of people up. And I can't really see how cutting off a supply of qualified, interested, and partly trained applicants really helps anyone out. My guess is that it was kind of hard to comply with the self-imposed hiring initiatives that way. And I'm just going to leave it at that. But as for FAA HR advice, I really don't know what to tell you, unfortunately, because there may or may not be some hierarchy about who gets preference for what degrees and certifications and so on. But if it does exist, well, it'd be a secret to anybody outside HR. And that's, of course, who does the hiring. Now, my understanding is that the criteria for hiring decisions, especially for controllers, is kind of constantly changing. And they don't really share what the criteria is anyway. And I've heard horror stories, though, about people getting hired and their paperwork gets mysteriously lost or whatever. But what I can say is that having a backup plan is always good. I mean, I've used mine twice. And when the FAA hires off the street, I doubt that having a bunch of industry experience would ever work against you in any way. Now, technically, I was hired off the street since I wasn't CTI. But my resume had almost 15 years of aviation experience on it at the time. So maybe that had something to do with it. But then again, that was a decade ago, and I was sitting in class next to a kid who worked at a liquor store the week before. So go figure. If you can get hired at an airline as a dispatcher, but without a two-year degree, then yeah, maybe the dispatch route might be best. You're right. It's a quicker way into the industry and into making money. And it might help you with FAA HR, but unfortunately, you're missing out on having a degree that way, which might hurt you elsewhere. But then again, you could do a degree online or something like that while you're dispatching and already making money. But that, of course, assumes that you can actually get a job dispatching, and frankly, I don't know how competitive that market is. If you're wanting to possess a two-year degree, though, well, I suppose that getting one in aviation would be cool, and that way you could put that you have a two-year degree, uh, maybe CTI or aviation management, whatever they're calling it, or something in your FAA application. And chances are, that would be as good as or probably better than dispatch, but like you said, it'll probably cost you more money. For a while, the FAA was really big on having customer service experience, and they would ignore the lack of a college degree if you had maybe five to seven years of customer service under your belt. So if you do have a bunch of customer service experience, then maybe that could help you kind of decide. So anyway, I wish I could tell you exactly what to do, but unfortunately I can't because I'm just not privy to the inside information that you really need. But before we depart the fix on this topic, I just want to mention that there are a ton of scholarships available that might help you take money out of the equation a little bit too. So I'll leave a link to the AOPA ones in the show notes. And when you go to that page, you're actually going to see my friend Nick on the page with a little quote about what it meant for him to be the recipient of one of them. And, you know, being the recipient of a scholarship in addition to the money, eh, it tends to look pretty good on a resume. Just saying. So see what I mean? I think it's a tough call. And without sounding like a total cop out, I think the only person who can actually make the decision is Brienne herself. But hey, if you're yelling at your radio or your phone right now saying, dude, just tell her to whatever... Well then, hey, shoot me an email. Let me know what you think. I'll pass it along to Brienne, and I think everybody else would like to hear too. What would you do?
Okay, now on to some choices that should have been made differently. Let's talk about what's going on with the 737 MAX. Quick disclaimer, as of this recording, we still aren't 100% sure that the cause of the Ethiopian crash was the Boeing MCAS, but all signs point to the same cause, just like the Lion Air one. And without doing too much armchair quarterbacking here, I want to talk about how we got here. So I've been sharing articles on Twitter and on Facebook for days now about this, and everyone that I've shared has been just a little bit different. One was about how better pilot training could have prevented the crashes, and yeah, that's probably right, but most people I've talked to say that the system is flawed. So even though the pilots may have been able to overcome it or outsmart it, it shouldn't have been there anyway. And I tend to agree. So no matter what you've heard about this whole situation, I'm sure it's something that just doesn't sit right with you. It doesn't sit right with me at all. But why did Boeing add this thing in the first place? And how on earth did it get certified like that? Well, I found an article from the Seattle Times, of all places, and assuming that the facts in the article are all accurate, I think it gives a really good synopsis of how this whole thing ended up the way it did. And no matter where you fall on this thing, you need to listen to this article, because apparently this is the reality of how it all went down. So the article is called Flawed Analysis, Failed Oversight how Boeing and the FAA certified the suspect 737 MAX flight control system. It's by Dominic Gates in the Seattle Times. As Boeing hustled in 2015 to catch up to Airbus and certify its new 737 MAX, Federal Aviation Administration managers pushed the agency's safety engineers to delegate safety assessments to Boeing itself and to speedily approve the resulting analysis. But the original safety analysis that Boeing delivered to the FAA for a new flight control system on the MAX, a report used to certify the plane is safe to fly, had several crucial flaws. That flight control system, called MCAS, Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, is now under scrutiny after two crashes of the jet in less than five months resulted in Wednesday's FAA order to ground the plane. Current and former engineers directly involved with the evaluations or familiar with the document shared details of Boeing's system safety analysis of MCAS, which the Seattle Times confirmed. The safety analysis, number one, understated the power of the new flight control system, which was designed to swivel the horizontal tail to push the nose of the plane down to avert a stall, And when the planes later entered service, MCAS was capable of moving the tail more than four times farther than was stated in the initial safety analysis document. Number two, failed to account for how the system could reset itself each time a pilot responded, thereby missing the potential impact of the system repeatedly pushing the airplane's nose downward. And number three, they assessed a failure of the system as one level below catastrophic. But even that hazardous danger level should have precluded activation of the system based on an input from a single sensor. And yet that's how it was designed. The people who spoke to the Seattle Times and shared details of the safety analysis all spoke on condition of anonymity to protect their jobs at the FAA and other aviation organizations. Both Boeing and the FAA were informed of the specifics of the story and were asked for responses 11 days ago before the second crash of a 737 MAX last Sunday. Late Friday, the FAA said it followed its standard certification process on the MAX. Citing a busy week, a spokesperson said the agency was, quote, unable to delve into any detailed inquiries, end quote. Boeing responded Saturday with a statement that, Quote, the FAA considered the final configuration and operating parameters of the MCAS during MAX certification and concluded that it met all certification and regulatory requirements, end quote, adding that it is, quote, unable to comment because of the ongoing investigation, end quote, into the crashes. Boeing did not respond directly to the detailed description of the flaws in MCAS certification beyond saying that, quote, there are some significant mischaracterizations, end quote. Several technical experts inside the FAA said October's Lion Air crash, where the MCAS had clearly been implicated by investigators in Indonesia, is only the latest indicator that the agency's delegation of airplane certification has gone too far, and that it's inappropriate for Boeing employees to have so much authority over safety analysis of Boeing jets. Quote, we need to make sure the FAA is much more engaged in failure assessments and the assumptions that go into them, end quote, said one FAA safety engineer. Going against a long Boeing tradition of giving the pilot complete control of the aircraft, the MAX's new MCAS flight control system was designed to act in the background without pilot input. It was needed because the MAX's much larger engines had to be placed farther forward on the wing, changing the airframe's aerodynamic lift. Designed to activate automatically only in the extreme flight situation of a high-speed stall, this extra kick downward of the nose would make the plane feel the same to a pilot as the older model 737s. Boeing engineers authorized to work on behalf of the FAA developed the system safety analysis for MCAS, a document which in turn was shared with foreign air safety regulators in Europe, Canada, and elsewhere in the world. The document, developed to ensure the safe operation of the 737 MAX, concluded that the system complied with all applicable FAA regulations, yet black box data retrieved after the Lion Air crash indicates that a single faulty sensor, a vein on the outside of the fuselage that measures the plane's angle of attack, the angle between the airflow and the wing, 
triggered MCAS multiple times during the deadly flight, initiating a tug-of-war as the system repeatedly pushed the nose of the plane down and the pilots wrestled with the controls to pull it back up before the final crash. On Wednesday, when announcing the grounding of the 737 MAX, the FAA cited similarities in the flight trajectory of the Lion Air flight and the crash of the Ethiopian Flight 302 last Sunday. Investigators also found the Ethiopian plane's jack screw, a part that moves the horizontal tail of the aircraft, and it indicated that the jet's horizontal tail was in an unusual position, with MCAS as one possible reason for that. Investigators are working to determine if MCAS could be the cause of both crashes. The FAA, citing lack of funding and resources, has over the years delegated increasing authority to Boeing to take on more of the work of certifying the safety of its own airplanes. Early on in certification of the 737 MAX, the FAA safety engineering team divided up the technical assessments that would be delegated to Boeing versus those they considered more critical and would be retained within the FAA. But several FAA technical experts said in interviews that as certification proceeded, managers prodded them to speed the process. Development of the MAX was lagging nine months behind the rival Airbus A320 NEO, Time was of the essence for Boeing. A former FAA safety engineer who was directly involved in certifying the MAX said that halfway through the certification process, quote, we were asked by management to re-evaluate what would be delegated. Management thought we had retained too much at the FAA. There was constant pressure to re-evaluate our initial decisions, the former engineer said, and even after we had reassessed it, there was continued discussion by management about delegating even more items down to the Boeing company, end quote. Even the work that was retained, such as reviewing technical documents provided by Boeing, was sometimes curtailed. Quote, there wasn't a complete and proper review of the documents, end quote, the former engineer added. Quote, review was rushed to reach certain certification dates, end quote. When time was too short for FAA technical staff to complete a review, sometimes managers either signed off on the documents themselves or delegated their review back to Boeing. Quote, the FAA managers, not the agency technical experts, have final authority on delegation, end quote, the engineer said. In this atmosphere, the system safety analysis on MCAS, just one piece of the mountain of documents needed for certification, was delegated to Boeing. The original Boeing document provided to the FAA included a description specifying a limit of how much the system could move the horizontal tail. Powerful movement of the tail was required to avert a high-speed stall when the plane was in danger of losing lift and spiraling down. The behavior of a plane in a high angle of attack stall is difficult to model in advance purely by analysis, and so, as the test pilots work through stall recovery routines during flight tests on a new airplane, it's not uncommon to tweak the flight control software to refine the jet's performance. After the Lion Air Flight 610 crash, Boeing for the first time provided the airline's details about MCAS. Boeing's bulletin to the airline stated that the limit of MCAS's command was 2.5 degrees. That number was new to FAA engineers who had seen 0.6 degrees in the safety assessment. Quote, the FAA believed the airplane was designed to the 0.6 limit, and that's what the foreign regulatory authorities thought too, said an FAA engineer. It makes a difference in your assessment of the hazard involved. End quote. The higher limit meant that each time MCAS was triggered, it caused a much greater movement of the tail than was specified in that original safety analysis document. The former FAA safety engineer who worked on the MAX certification and a former Boeing flight controls engineer who worked on the MAX as an authorized representative of the FAA both said that such safety analyses are required to be updated to reflect the most accurate aircraft information following flight tests. Quote, the numbers should match whatever design was tested and fielded, said the former FAA engineer but both said that sometimes agreements were made to update the documents only at some later date. Quote, it's possible the latest numbers wouldn't be in there as long as it was reviewed, and they concluded the differences wouldn't change the conclusions or the severity of the hazard assessment, said the former Boeing flight controls engineer. Quote, none of the engineers were aware of a higher limit, said a second current FAA engineer. The discrepancy over this number is magnified by another element in the system safety analysis, the limit of the system's authority to move the tail applies each time the MCAS is triggered, and it can be triggered multiple times, as it was in the Lion Air flight. One current FAA safety engineer said that every time the pilots on the Lion Air flight reset the switches on their control columns to pull the nose back up, MCAS would have kicked in again and, quote, allowed new increments of 2.5 degrees. So, once they pushed a couple of times, they were at full stop, meaning at the full extent of the tail swivel, he said. Peter Lemmy, a former Boeing flight controls engineer who is now an avionics and satellite communications consultant, said that because MCAS reset each time it was used, it, quote, effectively has unlimited authority, end quote. Swiveling the horizontal tail, which is technically called the stabilizer, to the end stop gives the airplane's nose the maximum possible push downward. Quote, it had full authority to move the stabilizer the full amount, Lemmy said. There was no need for that. Nobody should have agreed to giving it unlimited authority, end quote. On the Lion Air flight, when the MCAS pushed the jet's nose down, the captain pulled it back up using thumb switches on the control column. Still operating under the false angle of attack reading, the MCAS kicked in each time to swivel the horizontal tail and push the nose down again. 
The black box data released in the preliminary investigation report shows that after this cycle repeated 21 times, the plane's captain ceded control of the first officer. As MCAS pushed the nose down two or three times more, the first officer responded with only two short flicks of the thumb switches. At a limit of two and a half degrees, two cycles of MCAS without correction would have been enough to reach the maximum nose down effect. In the final seconds, the black box data shows the captain resumed control and pulled up with high force. But it was too late. The plane dived into the sea at more than 500 miles an hour. The bottom line of Boeing's system safety analysis with regard to MCAS was that, in normal flight, an activation of MCAS to the maximum assumed authority of 0.6 degrees was classified as only a, quote, major failure, end quote, meaning that it could cause physical distress to people on the plane, but not death. In the case of an extreme maneuver, specifically when the plane is in a bank descending spiral, an activation of MCAS was classified as a, quote, hazardous failure, end quote, meaning that it could cause serious or fatal injuries to a small number of passengers. And that's still one level below a, quote, catastrophic failure, which represents the loss of the plane with multiple fatalities. The former Boeing Flight Controls engineer who worked on the MAXIS certification on behalf of the FAA said that whether a system on a jet can rely on one sensor input or must have two is driven by the failure classification in the system safety analysis. He said virtually all equipment on any commercial airplane, including the various sensors, is reliable enough to meet the, quote, major failure requirement, which is that the probability of a failure must be less than a 1 in 100,000. Such systems are therefore typically allowed to rely on a single input sensor. But when the consequences are assessed to be more severe, with a, quote, hazardous failure requirement, demanding a more stringent probability of 1 in 10 million, then a system typically must have at least two separate input channels in case one goes wrong. Boeing's system safety analysis assessment that the MCAS failure would be hazardous troubles former flight controls engineer Lemmy because the system is triggered by the reading from a single angle of attack sensor. Quote, a hazardous failure mode depending on a single sensor? I don't think that passes muster, says Lemmy. Like all 737s, the MAX actually has two of the sensors, one on each side of the fuselage near the cockpit, but the MCAS was designed to take a reading from only one of them. Lemmy said Boeing could have designed the system to compare the readings from the two vanes, which would have indicated if one of them was way off. Alternatively, the system could have been designed to check that the angle of attack reading was accurate when the plane was taxiing on the ground before takeoff, when the angle of attack should read zero. Quote, they could have designed a two-channel system, or they could have tested the value of the angle of attack on the ground, said Lemmy. I don't know why they didn't. End quote. The black box data provided in the preliminary investigation report shows that readings from the two sensors differed by some 20 degrees, not only throughout the flight, but also while the airplane taxied on the ground before takeoff. After the Lion Air crash, 737 MAX pilots around the world were notified about the existence of MCAS and what to do if the system was triggered inappropriately. Boeing insists that the pilots on the Lion Air flight should have recognized that the horizontal stabilizer was moving uncommanded and should have responded with a standard pilot checklist procedure to handle what's called a stabilizer runaway. If they'd done so, the pilots would have hit the cutoff switches and deactivated automatic stabilizer movement. Boeing has pointed out that the pilots flying the same plane on the day before the crash experienced similar behavior to the Flight 610 and did exactly that. They threw the stabilizer cutoff switches, regained control, and continued with the rest of the flight. However, pilots and aviation experts say that what happened on the Lion Air flight doesn't look like a standard stabilizer runaway, because that's defined as continuous, uncommanded movement of the tail. On the accident flight, the tail movement wasn't continuous the pilots were able to counter the nose-down movement multiple times. In addition, the MCAS altered the control column response to the stabilizer movement. Pulling back on the column normally interrupts any stabilizer nose-down movement, but with MCAS operating, that control column function was disabled. These differences certainly could have confused the Lion Air pilots as to what was going on. Since MCAS was supposed to activate only in extreme circumstances far outside the normal flight envelope, Boeing decided that 737 pilots needed no extra training on the system, and indeed that they didn't even need to know about it. It was not even mentioned in the flight manuals. That stance allowed the new jet to earn a common type rating with existing 737 models, allowing airlines to minimize training of pilots moving to the max. Dennis Tager, a spokesman for the Allied Pilots Association at American Airlines, said his training on moving from the old 737NG model cockpit to the new 737 MAX consisted of little more than a one-hour session on an iPad with no simulator training. Minimizing MAX pilot transition training was an important cost saving for Boeing's airline customers, a key selling point for the jet, which has racked up more than 5,000 orders. The company's website pitched the jet to airlines with a promise that, quote, as long as you build your 737 MAX fleet, millions of dollars will be saved because of its commonality with the next generation 737. In the aftermath of the crash, officials at the unions for both American and Southwest Airlines pilots criticized Boeing for providing no information about MCAS or its possible malfunction in the 737 MAX pilot manuals. An FAA safety engineer said the lack of prior information could have been crucial in the Lion Air crash. 
On Monday, before the grounding of the 737 MAX, Boeing outlined a flight control software enhancement for the 737 MAX that has been developing since soon after the Lion Air crash. According to a detailed FAA briefing to legislators, Boeing will change the MCAS software to give the system input from both angle of attack sensors, and will also limit how much MCAS can move the horizontal tail in response to an erroneous signal. And when activated, the system will kick in only for one cycle rather than multiple times. Boeing also plans to update pilot training requirements and flight crew manuals to include MCAS. These proposed changes mirror the critique made by the safety engineers in the story. They'd spoken to the Seattle Times before the Ethiopian crash. The FAA said it will mandate Boeing's software fix and an airworthiness directive no later than April. In facing legal actions brought by the families of those killed, Boeing will have to explain why those fixes were not part of the original system design, and the FAA will have to defend its certification of the system as safe. Again, that article by Dominic Gates from the Seattle Times. So it's no secret that we run the busiest and also safest air traffic control system in the U.S., and I'm a functional part of it. And as someone who's seen the inner workings from a bunch of different angles and for a significant amount of time, I can say that I'm actually proud of how we do things here most of the time. But this time, not so much. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from the one, the only, Sully Sullenberger that I think says it best. He said recently in an interview that, quote, I believe there's always a strong business case for safety. It's always better and cheaper to get it right than to try and repair the damage after the fact. When there's a loss of life, there's no way to repair that damage. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll be sharing as much as possible as the details come out. And until next time, your frequency change is approved and report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day. I'm Brienne from Anoka. The Podcasting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. Brandon's comments and those of his guests, the website content, and any of the social media, etc. are not part of his official responsibility as a controller or as an FAA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are his and those of his guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. There is no nexus between podcasting on a plane and the FAA. Also, while he is a CFI, he is not acting as your CFI, nor is he your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink, or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie, and fun, but is in no way, shape, or form professional advice or legal counsel. If you're in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be.